Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we near the end of this series, we want to thank you because you have been present with us in our study of your holy word. We ask now, as we near the end of this series, that your spirit will be with us once more, that you will instruct us, and that you will give us the power to live in harmony with what we study today, for it is extremely important. Thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence. We claim that promise in the wonderful name that is above all name, the name of Jesus. Amen. In our study today, we're going to look at the parable of the sheep and the goats, as well as two or three other passages that are related to this particular passage in Matthew chapter 25. So the first thing that we want to do is read the passage itself. It's lengthy. We find it in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And as I read, please focus on the details. Try to fix the details in your mind so that uh, you uh, understand the interpretation that we're going to give to this particular parable. I'm reading now from Matthew 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse 40, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, and now notice this, very important point, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So that is the lengthy parable or story that Jesus told. Now we want to ask three questions of this passage. First question, to whom did Jesus address this parable? Second question, when and where will this judgment take place? And finally, what will be the standard that will be used in that judgment? So three questions we're going to try to answer. 
To whom did Jesus address the parable? When and where will this take this judgment take place? And what will be the standard of the judgment? So let's answer the first question. Did Jesus direct this parable to believers or to unbelievers? The fact is, as we have seen in previous lectures, Matthew 24 is addressed to those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus began his sermon in verse 4 by saying, Make sure that no one deceives you, speaking to his disciples. After describing the signs of his coming from verses 4 through verse 31 of Matthew chapter 24, we find Jesus telling four parables. And the one that we're studying today is one of the four parables that apply to believers. Those four parables, of course, we've studied some of them already. The good and faithful servant, the ten virgins, the talents, and then the one that we're studying today, the parable of the sheep and the goats. So basically, Matthew 24 and 25 are addressed to people who claim to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It's not written pli primarily for people who don't believe in Jesus, for people who have not been converted or don't belong to God's own people. These chapters are addressed to those who claim to be followers or disciples of Jesus Christ. So then let's ask the question, when will this judgment that is described here take place? Well, some of you might be surprised to know that this parable applies to events that take place after the millennium primarily. Let's take a look at when this separation will take place. The passage gives us several clues. The first clue is that the Son of Man is sitting on a great white throne and he is sitting by himself. Very important. When Jesus went to heaven, he sat with his Father on his throne. Secondly, this throne is the throne of his glory. In other words, it's Christ's glorious throne. Number three, all nations are gathered together before the throne, which means that every person who belonged to those nations must have resurrected at this particular point. The next point is that there is an examination of the evidence in this judgment. And then a verdict is pronounced based on the evidence that was examined in the judgment. The sentence is then executed in the lake of fire. And the lake of fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So these are the characteristics that we find in this particular parable that indicate when this judgment occurs. The Son of Man is sitting on a great white throne. It's the throne of His glory. All nations are gathered together before the throne. Books are opened. The evidence is examined. A verdict is given based on the evidence in the books. Then the sentence is, is executed in the lake of fire, and the lake of fire has been pre prepared for the devil and his angels. Now the book of Revelation contains a similar scene of judgment. There's a parallel passage in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9, and verses 11 through 15. Now we're gonna, not going to take time to read these verses, you can do this at your leisure, but once again I repeat that there's a similar passage in Revelation 20, 7 through 9, and verses 11 through 15, and these verses contain the same elements that we noticed in the judgment that is mentioned in Matthew chapter 25. Now, there's a certain sense in which this judgment that is described here in Matthew 25 takes place at the second coming, but that will be only a partial fulfillment of this parable. If you read Great Controversy, page 322, Ellen White uh, presents this parable as taking place 
at the second coming of Christ. But she also presents a broader fulfillment of this uh, parable in early writings, page 53, to events that take place after the millennium. Let's notice the elements that apply to after the millennium according to the book of Revelation. First of all, there is a great white throne above the holy city. In Great Controversy, page 665, Ellen White wrote, Far above the city, upon a foundation of burnished gold, is a throne, high and lifted up. Upon this throne sits the Son of God, and around Him are the subjects of His kingdom. So you have a great white throne. And Jesus is sitting on that throne. You can read it in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, and also verses 7 and 8, tell us that all nations are gathered together in, before the throne that is outside the holy city. Everyone who has ever lived in history has resurrected after the millennium. Then, Revelation 20, verse 13, tells us that there is an examination of the evidence. In other words, books are opened, and the evidence is discussed and looked at. After the evidence is examined, there is a verdict that is given. You can read that in Great Controversy, page 666, and Early Writings, page 53. And then after the verdict is given, those who are in the city are told, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The wicked now who have had a verdict emitted against them will suffer the execution of the judgment in the lake of fire. That's in Revelation 20 and verse 10. And then we notice that the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels and Revelation 20 verse 10 tells us that Satan and his angels are cast into the lake of fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So the third question that we asked is, what is the criterion of the judgment? In other words, what is the standard of the judgment? What are the actions of the sheep and the goats compared with that doomed the goats and saved the righteous? Well, the book of Revelation tells us who will be allowed inside the city and who will not be allowed inside the city. The perspective of Revelation falls upon what people did that they were not supposed to do. In other words, they committed sins that excluded them from the holy city. Let's read several verses in the book of Revelation where we see clearly that the criterion of the judgment in Revelation has to do with what people did that they should never have done. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, we find these words, But there shall by no means enter it, that is the city, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So you notice, those who defile, those who commit abominable acts, those who lie, they are not written in the Lamb's book of life and they are not allowed to enter the holy city. Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15. I wish I could uh, deal with this text more um, fully at this time because there's a variation in the translation. Some translations say, blessed are those who wash their robes. The King James and the New King James translate, Blessed are those who do His commandments. There are clear reasons why the translation, Do His commandments, is the best translation. Revelation chapter 22, verses 14 and 15 tells us who will be allowed into the city and who will not and why. It says there in Revelation 22, verse 14, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So you'll notice here, those who do His commandments, they have the right to the tree of life, and they enter through the gates into the city. God's people 
who are in the city kept God's commandments. But now it refers to those who are outside. But outside, verse 15, are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Those are violations of the Ten Commandments. Sexually immoral would be, you shall not commit adultery. Murderers, thou shalt not kill. Idolaters, uh, the second commandment, don't make images and bow to them. Practicing a lie, you shall not bear false witness. Those outside the city actually broke God's commandments. They were disobedient to God's commandments. Notice one more text on the standard of the judgment in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. So inside the city are the overcomers. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But now notice who is outside. It says there, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you notice that those who are outside the city, they actually broke God's Ten Commandments. They did not obey them. So the emphasis in the book of Revelation is that those outside the city did things that they were not supposed to do. In other words, they hung on to their sins. They refused to repent and have their lives changed through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the criterion in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, appears to be different. But you are going to notice that it is actually complementary. It is the other side of the coin, so to speak. Whereas the book of Revelation emphasizes the sin of commission, the book of Matthew emphasizes the sin of omission. What do I mean? The emphasis in Revelation falls upon what the wicked did that they should not have done. The emphasis in Matthew is upon what the wicked did not do that they should have done. I want to read you a very interesting statement that we find in the book Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 220. It reads like this. The condemning power of the law of God extends not only to the things we do, but to the things we do not do. <laughs> Interesting. So the condemning power of the law of God extends not only to the things we do, but to the things we do not do. We are not to justify ourselves in omitting. That's why I call it the sin of omission. We are not to justify ourselves in omitting to do the things that God requires. We must not only cease to do evil, but we must learn to do well. God has given us powers to be exercised in good works. And if these powers are not put to the use, we shall certainly be set down as wicked and slothful servants. We may not have committed grievous sins. Such offenses may not stand registered against us in the book of God. But the fact that our deeds are not recorded as pure, good, elevated, and noble, showing that we have not improved our entrusted talents, places us under condemnation. Now you notice in Matthew chapter 25 that the goats are placed on the left hand side and the sheep are placed on the right hand side. In the Bible, the right hand side is the side of God's favor. You can read that in Desire of Ages, page 644. You'll notice, for example, that Jesus, when he goes to heaven, he sits at the Father's right hand. Ellen White provides a very interesting detail in Desire of Ages 644 where she says that at the Last Supper the beloved disciple John sat on Christ's right side whereas Judas the traitor sat on the left side of Jesus. 
when the fishermen threw out their nets all night on the left side of the boat and they fished nothing. The next morning Jesus appeared on land and uh, said to the disciples, cast the net on the right hand side and you will catch fish. And they cast it on the right hand side because Jesus was on that side and they embraced a multitude of fish. You know, the archaic meaning of the word sinister is toward the left hand side. In fact, in Spanish, they still use the word siniestra as something negative. It's the sinister side. The left side, left side is the sinister side. And of course, we know that when a person gets up in a bad mood, we say that he woke up with his left foot. So the goats are placed on the side of God's disfavor, whereas the sheep are placed on the side of God's favor. The passage in Matthew chapter 25 reminds us of some verses that we find in Isaiah 58 and verses 6 and 7. This is how it reads. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to, to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? This passage is very similar to what we find in Matthew chapter 25. And if you read the context of Isaiah 58, 6, and 7, you'll find that the Jews were fasting and they were uh, exhibiting their affliction, and yet they were ignoring the needs of those individuals that uh, needed help. However, the parable of Jesus is not simply telling us that we should be active in community services, in giving out literal food and clothing and things like that, what Seventh-day Adventists call Dorcas work. There is a spiritual dimension to the counsel of Jesus as well. I was hungry, Jesus says. People are hungry for spiritual food. The Bible. I was thirsty, Jesus says. People are thirsting for the Holy Spirit, represented by fresh water. I was a stranger, Jesus said. Those who have not embraced Jesus are strangers to the covenant and without hope, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 and verse 19. Jesus says, I was naked. That means that people are destitute of the righteousness of Christ because spiritual nakedness simply means that you don't have Christ's righteousness. I was sick, Jesus says. Well, people are sick with the virus of sin. And we have the remedy. The remedy is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I was in prison. There are multitudes of people who are prisoners to sin and prisoners to Satan, according to Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. So you'll notice that these, uh, these elements that Jesus speaks about, things that need to be done in favor of the destitute, not only has a physical dimension, it also has a spiritual dimension. The Bible speaks uh, of bread as food, uh, as the Bible as food. Uh, the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit as drink, John 7, 37 to 39. The Bible speaks about strangers becoming members of the covenant community, Ephesians 2, 12 and 19. The Bible speaks about those who are sick with the virus of sin, Isaiah 1, verse 6. The Bible speaks of, about those who are prisoners, spiritually speaking, you find that in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It's fashionable today for Christians to say, Oh, if I could only visit the Holy Land, if I could only walk where Jesus walked, to experience baptism in the Jordan River like Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. But regarding the desire of people to go to the Holy Land, as it is called, Ellen White had something to say about that desire. In the book Desire of Ages, page 640, she wrote, Many feel that it would be a great privilege 
to visit the scenes of Christ's life on earth, to walk where he trod, to look upon the lake beside which he loved to teach, and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested. But we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany, in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footprints beside the sickbed, in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. You'll notice that the sheep did not care who gets the credit. They did not serve in order to gain accolades and applause. They didn't do their things in order to be saved, nor for money. What they did, they performed spontaneously and naturally because they had the love of Jesus in their hearts and that love flowed out towards others. Are we aware that when we do these things that Jesus says we're supposed to do, that we are actually doing them to Jesus? In that you have done them unto these, the least, my brethren, you have done it unto me, is what Jesus said. You'll notice in the parable that, that the goats did not mistreat those in need. In other words, they, did, they didn't kick the hungry and the thirsty and the stranger and the naked and the sick and those who were in prison. No, they did not mistreat them. Perhaps they even allowed the people to eat the crumbs that fell from their tables like the rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Their grievous sin was that they ignored those who were in need and they did not do what they were supposed to be doing. In ignoring those in need, they ignored Jesus. During his ministry, Jesus spoke of love and compassion for those in need. On the other hand, he had strong words of rebuke for those who made a profession of religion, but did not act in harmony with what they claimed to believe. The words of Jesus to the goats are unusual. We are not used to hearing Jesus speak in this manner. Depart from me, you cursed, into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These are strong words on the part of Jesus Christ. Now we find some other stories in Scripture that illustrate the lessons that we find in this parable. The story of the rich young ruler is an illustration of the lessons of this particular parable. You see, uh, there are two sides to perfection. The first side is ceasing to do evil, and the other side is doing good. If we have only one side, we have an unbalanced religion, and we will never make it into the kingdom. We must cease to do evil, and also, at the same time, do good. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22, where we have the story of the rich young ruler. And I'm going to interpret as we go along in our study. Matthew 19, verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? So this young man wants eternal life, not just life in this world. He wants to live eternally. So he's asking Jesus, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? Verse 17. So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. However, if you want to enter into life, and we understand that that's eternal life, according to the context, if you want to have eternal life, Jesus is saying, keep the commandments. Oh, wow, this young man, when he heard that, he said, that's fantastic. I've kept the commandments all my life. So I'm almost ready to enter the kingdom. So he starts thinking, he says, well, I wonder whether he means the Ten Commandments. I better clarify and find out if when he says, keep the commandments, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Now, I've kept them since my youth, but I want to make sure that he's talking about those commandments. So, in verse 18, he said to him, that is to Jesus, which ones? Jesus said, now Jesus quotes 
the last six commandments that have to do with our duty towards our neighbor, but he didn't quote one. In place of that one, he put another one in there. And you'll notice here this, the commandments that Jesus quoted. Which ones? You shall not murder. That's commandment number six. You shall not commit adultery. Number seven, you shall not steal. Number eight, you shall not bear false witness. Number nine, and number ten, of course, is you shall not covet. But instead of that one Jesus placed in there, uh, actually he continues, honor your father and your mother. And then the last one is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus quotes all of the last six commandments. Only the last commandment, you shall not covet. Instead of that, he puts, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because loving your neighbor is the opposite of covetousness. So it's the positive way of saying, you shall not covet. And now the story develops in verse 20. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? See, there was a funny feeling in him that there was something that was missing. Yes, he was keeping the command. He wasn't killing anybody. He wasn't committing adultery with somebody else's wife. He wasn't bearing false witness. And he was honoring his parents. You know, he was at, le at least externally keeping the commandments. But he feels like there must be something lacking that Jesus hasn't said. So in verse 21, Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, now listen to that word. He's asked, what do I need to do to have eternal life? Jesus says, if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. And then Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, so this says that you have to have perfection in order to, in order to enter eternal life. Remember that word, if you want to be perfect. So Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. So this young man has said, oh, I've never killed anyone. I've, I've never dishonored my parents. I've never committed adultery with anyone. You know, I've never borne false witness against my neighbor. I've never done any of these bad things. But Jesus says, okay, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure with me in heaven. What did the young man do? Verse 22, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The problem with the rich young ruler is that outwardly at least he abstained from evil but he did not perform the good. His sin was not the sin of commission, it was the sin of omission. God will judge us in the final day not only for the bad things we did that we should not have but for the good that we should have done and did not do. So remember, Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor. Now we have another story. It's called the parable of the Good Samaritan. But really, it's not only a parable. It's actually a true life story. In fact, Ellen White tells us in Desire of Ages that the Levite and the priest who bypassed this man who had fallen into the hands of robbers were actually present when Jesus told the story. They were probably wondering, oh, you know, how did this man find out what we did in bypassing this man who was in dire need? Now you notice in this story that we find in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, that the, there's a young lawyer when I say lawyer, he's an expert in the writings of Moses, in the legal writings of Moses. Uh, in other words, he's a sacred lawyer, if you, want, if you please, not a secular lawyer. Uh, but he comes and he asks Jesus a question. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer, that is someone who's an expert in the writings of Moses, stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Is that the same question that the rich young ruler asked? Absolutely. This young expert in the law of Moses, he wants to have eternal life. And he says, what do I need to do to have eternal life? Well, Jesus now throws the question at him. He said to him, 
what is written in the law, that is the writings of Moses, what is written in the law, what is your reading of it? In other words, Jesus is saying, you tell me what you need to do to receive eternal life. Verse 27, so he answered, this is the young, the young expert, and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And now Jesus says to this young man, and he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. In other words, do this and you will have eternal life. So he, he's saying to him, you know, love God above everything, love your neighbor as yourself, and you will have eternal life. Hmm, this lawyer, he knew that he wasn't doing what Jesus told him to do. So in verse 29, we find these words. However, he, that is the, this expert, wanting to justify himself, because he wasn't practicing what he was preaching, by the way, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In other words, what does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? Who is the neighbor that I'm supposed to love? Verse 30, then Jesus answered and said, now Jesus is going to illustrate who a neighbor is and what you need to do to have eternal life. Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Believe me, it is down. I've been over there. It's a tortuous road that goes through the Judean wilderness from Jerusalem, which is high, down to Jericho. So it says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Now, spiritually speaking, this has a spiritual application. Spiritual speaking, who is the great thief? The great thief is Satan. In John chapter 10, Jesus says that Satan does not come but to steal. So the thieves represent Satan and his angels. And what did the thieves do? They stripped him of his clothing. What does clothing represent in Scripture? It represents righteousness. So Satan, with the human race, he uh, stole from them eternal life, and he stripped them of their righteousness. And not only that, but it says that the thieves wounded him. Folks, the human race is wounded by sin, by the disease of sin. And then it says, he wounded him, and the thieves departed, leaving him half dead. Without external help, this man would have died. He needed someone to come from outside to help him, or else he would have died. Just like it was necessary for Jesus to come to, from heaven to help us, or else we would have died. So now in verse 31, there is the minister that comes by, the pastor, if you please. Now by chance, a certain priest, this is a religious leader, came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. By the way, this priest might have thought that he was uh, on a rush to get to Jerusalem because he had to do the services of the sanctuary. Or perhaps he thought, well, the thieves might still be around, so I better get out of here. He probably thought, well, if I help this man, I might get my garments all, all uh, stained with blood. I don't know what excuse he used, but the Bible says that this religious leader saw him and passed by. Then you have a Levite which would be a symbol of the deacons of the church because they cared for the sanctuary, leaders of the church, in other words. So it says, likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he was a little bit better because it says he came and looked. At least the, the priest, all he did was saw him and passed by. This one, the Levite, came and looked, but he passed by on the other side. In other words, they ignored this man who was in need. But then... Verse 33, a stranger comes. He's a Samaritan. He's not a member of the chosen people. However, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So the Samaritan has compassion on this Jewish man that has fallen into the hands of thieves. Who does the Samaritan represent in this story? The Samaritan represents Jesus Christ. Verse 34, 
So he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Is that what Jesus does with the wounds that sin have caused to humanity? Absolutely. Pouring on oil and wine. What do oil and wine represent symbolically in Scripture? Oil represents the Holy Spirit and wine represents the blood of Jesus. Those are the healing agents that God has given to heal a humanity that has been wounded by Satan and his angels. So it says, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn. Now he's going to bring him to church. <laughs> so it says he brought him to an inn. The inn represents the church and took care of him, at least for a while. On the next day, when he departed, you see, now the Good Samaritan is going to depart like Jesus departed to heaven. He took out two denarii, so he's going to give resources to the innkeeper, which would be the pastor of the church, and of course to the church in general. He took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, that is the pastor of the church, who has received gifts from God to help those who are in need, and said to him, Take care of him. And now notice this. There's a second coming of the Samaritan. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. In other words, I will bring my reward when I come again. Does Jesus promise to bring his reward when he comes again to give to those who have done, to those in need, to those who are hurt, and help them in their dire situation? Absolutely. So then verse 36 says, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The religion of Jesus is a religion of doing. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He didn't say, don't do unto others as you don't want them to do unto you. The religion of Jesus is an active religion. It is a dynamic religion. When Jesus is in the heart, we help other people and care about other people who have been wounded by Satan and his angels, and without external help, they would perish. Now let's go to another passage where the word perfect is used. I hope you haven't forgotten that Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if you would be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor. So perfection involves doing good to the poor, doing good to others. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through verse 48. It says there, you have heard, Jesus is speaking, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's the unconverted person's way of doing things. He knocked out my tooth, I'm going to knock out a tooth from him. He hit me in the nose, I hit him back in the nose. So Jesus says, you've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Rather, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, and take away your tunic, take him, uh, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. He doesn't say don't hate your enemies. He says love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. He's not saying bite your tongue so you don't curse your enemies. He says bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, when I'm preaching on this particular subject, I ask the congregation the following question. How many of yourselves... Consider yourselves sons of your Father in heaven. And everybody raises their hand and says, We are children of the Father. We are children of God. But there's a condition for being called children of God. Let's go back to verse 44 and connect verse 45. 
But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and curse, curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And then it says in verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So the condition is, according to this, love, bless, do good, and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What would it be like if God said, well, this person is my follower, therefore I'm going to give him rain and sunshine, but this individual has not accepted me, no rain and no sunshine. See, God not only asks us to do, do good, he also practices what he preaches. Verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? I mean, do, do worldlings who don't uh, love Jesus, have never accepted Jesus, do they love their mother and father and friends? Of course they do. So if we only love our mother and father and friends and our family, what more do we have than them? So for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? And now comes the conclusion. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What is this passage, passage saying that perfection is? It's not ceasing to do evil, but it is doing good. It's the other side of perfection. It's the positive side of perfection. Not only ceasing to do evil, but doing good. Loving enemies, blessing those who curse us, doing good to those who hate us, and praying for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. That is the side of perfection that has to do with doing. Just like in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now, the passage in Luke... The parallel passage in Luke uh, has this same content, but its conclusion is a little different. You're probably wondering if, be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect, means that you're supposed to be merciful and loving like the Father is. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 6 and verses 27 through 36. The parallel passage to what we just read, you're going to see the parallels as we begin to read. Here Jesus speaks, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And for him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want to do, want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the th unthankful and evil. Do you remember that in Matthew chapter 5 it said, Be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect after everything that we've read? Now notice the way that Luke expresses it. Verse 36, Be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. So what is be ye therefore perfect? It means be ye therefore merciful. So perfection does not only involve ceasing to do evil, but performing the good. James chapter 1 and verse 27 has the balance it has both sides of perfection, the ceasing to do evil and the doing of good. We find in James chapter 1 and verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father 
is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So you see the two sides of perfection in this verse. First of all, you have visiting orphans and widows, and secondly, keeping yourself unspotted from the world. In other words, do good and cease to do evil. Now how should we live while we wait for the coming of Jesus? Jesus gave us five indications of what we should be doing while we wait for Jesus to come. First of all, invest all of our resources in the finishing of God's work. Ellen White stated in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95, that all that Noah possessed, he invested in the ark. Every blow struck upon the ark was a witness to the people. So Noah invested everything he had in the ark. His time, his resources, his strength, and his intelligence. The second thing that Jesus said we're supposed to do while we wait is to watch. The parable of the good and faithful servant illustrates the need to watch. The word watch in the Gospels, and it's mentioned several times, means to be alert, to be wakeful, and to pay attention. You know, you can lock the door of your house for a thousand nights, and then on night 1001, you're in bed and you're nice and comfortable. You say, oh, I forgot to lock the door, but I'm so nice and warm under these covers, and you don't lock the door. That might be the night when the thief will come. And so we have to always be watchful because we do not know when the hour of the close of probation will come. Unfortunately, as Jesus delays his coming, the tendency is not to become more alert, but to become less alert and to lose anxiety and preparedness for the coming of Jesus. I remember uh, when I was a kid, I heard my parents talk about the second coming of Jesus. I also heard my grandparents speak about the second coming of Jesus. And uh, I'm sure that their parents and grandparents spoke to them about the second coming of Jesus. And it's been delayed. And the tendency is to say, well, you know, we know he's coming sometime, but he's not coming real soon. Another thing that Jesus told us to do was to pray. In Mark 13 and verse 33, Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray, because you do not, do not know when the hour is. Unfortunately, the disciples in the garden slept instead of praying, and therefore they fell into temptation. The fourth thing that Jesus said that we must do while we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus is to be ready. This is the emphasis of the parable of the ten virgins, to be ready all the time for the close of probation and for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I remember when I was about 10 years old, uh, we lived in the city of Caracas, Venezuela. My dad was the conference president. And my mother took my older sister to Wisconsin Academy to go to school. And uh, my, my dad knew the exact time that my mother was going to come back to Venezuela after she dropped off my sister. So, uh, you know, being two men in the house, uh, we didn't bother to wash the dishes very much. We didn't bother to clean the house. Uh, everything was somewhat in disarray because we said, well, you know, we know when mom is coming back. And so the day before she comes back, we're going to clean the house and we're going to wash the dishes and have everything spick and span when she comes back. Well, it just so happens that my mom decided to take an earlier flight. And of course, when she got home, she saw all of the dirty dishes in the kitchen and she saw the house in disarray. What is the lesson here? The lesson is that we should be ready all the time. We should have kept the dishes washed and we should have kept the house clean and that way my mother could have come at any time and there would not have been any problem whatsoever. The fifth thing that Jesus said that we're supposed to do is to occupy until Jesus comes. You see, Noah had an active faith. He not only preached, but he also worked with his hands. 
Benjamin Franklin once spoke some very wise words when he said, well done is better than well said. Likewise, when the building of the church is finished, when all the faithful believers have come into the church, then the probation, the door of probation will close and Jesus will come. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 13, Jesus stated, Occupy until I come. The Greek word is very interesting. It's the word pragmatiomai, where we get the word pragmatic in the, in the English language. What does it mean to be pragmatic? It means to put theory into practice. In other words, it's not enough to have a theory of salvation. The theory of salvation must be put into practice. Now I want to end by giving you an illustration, you know, for those who say that uh, the coming of Jesus is very, very delayed. You know, I remember one of the first times that I traveled overseas, in fact I think I was traveling to South America, uh, I was at the airport, checked in at the right time, and I noticed on the board that it said the flight was delayed for 12 hours. And so I said, what am I going to do at the airport for 12 hours? You know, I was in a, in a city where uh, there was actually nobody that I knew. So I had to stay in the airport for all 12 hours. I didn't have my computer with me. I didn't have any books to read. I'll tell you, even though it was a large airport and I could walk around the airport, you can only walk around so much. I got to the point where I almost was tearing out my hair, I was so bored, spending 12 hours in the airport without anything to do. It taught me a great lesson, and that is that if I took my computer and I took some books, I could read and work on my computer, and time would fly by a lot faster. You know, there have been occasions that I've been uh, at the airport where I'm working on my computer, and uh, I'm having so much fun doing research and writing that I kind of forget the time. And a couple of times I've almost forgotten my flight <laughs> because uh, I've been so involved in what I'm doing. And time flies when we're busy. Time flies when we're ready, when we pray, when we watch, and when we invest everything that we have in the cause of Christ. So let us put into practice these principles as we wait for the glorious moment of the coming of Jesus.